C'est un immense théologien. Il est gigantesque. He is one of the world's most eminent theologians, and his works are prodigious. With Irenaeus, you feel as if you're touching the cloak of Christ. It's a torrent, a pure torrent. He tells us something about the youthful vigor of the church in its earliest years. Although Irenaeus lived in the period of classical antiquity, he's profoundly modern. People of the 21st century can draw inspiration from his work without ever having the impression of returning to the past. Irenaeus was born in Smyrna, in Asia Minor, that is modern-day Turkey, around 130 AD. This is the time of the first Christians in the early church. Irenaeus' spiritual master was Polycarp, who was a disciple of St. John the Evangelist. So, one could almost say that Irenaeus was the grandson of St. John the Apostle. And spiritually, he most certainly was. I can describe the place where the blessed Polycarp used to sit and speak, how he arrived and how he left, his general mode of life and personal appearance, together with the words he spoke to the people. I remember what he said about John and about those who had known the Lord. These words, through God's mercy, came to my ears. I listened attentively and wrote them down, not on paper, but in my heart. And again, by God's grace, I have lovingly meditated upon them in my mind. Irenaeus is the one who gave us what we now call the rule of faith. The rule of faith is the first summary of what would later be known as our creed. These affirmations of faith are for transmission, for the transmission of an event. And this event is the Jesus Christ event. This is the fundamental meaning of tradition for him. Irenaeus is a transmitter of the gospel. He tried to communicate the essence of the gospel in all the questions which were sent to him. This is what he calls the tradition that comes from the apostles. The word tradition has unfortunately become run-of-the-mill, and we really don't feel its deeper significance anymore. But this word has a profoundly dynamic meaning. It means receiving and passing on. Tradition is not a package. It's a movement. And Irenaeus really highlighted this. Tradition is now understood rather as something that is frozen in time, even old-fashioned. And we forget that before being a noun, it was a verb, especially in Latin, trado, tradis, tradere. It's a verb, it's a process, it's not a thing. In Lyons, France, formerly called Luc Dunum, Irenaeus providentially escaped the persecution of the Christians in 177 AD. Pothinus, the first bishop of Lyons, was imprisoned and died from exhaustion in his cell. Christians who were Roman citizens were decapitated. Others suffered horrible deaths after being tortured in the arena, including the brave Blandina. Irenaeus was sent to Rome to hand a letter to Pope Eleutherius, which contained a detailed account of this martyrdom. On his return to this deeply wounded community, Irenaeus succeeded Pothinus and became the second bishop of Lyons. We cannot describe the violent fury of the pagans against the Christians and all that the blessed martyrs endured. They were jeered at, struck, dragged along the ground, stripped, stoned and imprisoned, enduring everything that the furious mob sought to inflict on its adversaries and enemies. He was greatly loved by all his parishioners and all the Christians nearby when he was in Lyons, and he bore his name just like a man of peace. 
Irenaeus was first and foremost a pastor. Moreover, when they sent him to Rome as an ambassador, the first Christians of Lyon, the first martyrs, said, we send you Irenaeus, our brother and companion. Even before mentioning that he is a priest and bishop, this clearly demonstrates the closeness and communion of Irenaeus with the people he was attached to. In the crisis that the Church is experiencing today, this formulation is very important for me. It is a kind of antidote against the temptation of clericalism. The second Bishop of Lyon, St. Irenaeus, was first introduced as a brother and companion of the Christians of Lyon. They accuse us wrongly. We are disturbance, Jean, you know it. We shouldn't be afraid of disturbing. The Lord is guiding us. We do not understand everything, but he is guiding us. Yes, I agree, but for now, it's hard. Irenaeus or Irenaeus in Greek means man of peace, and this is what the historian Eusebius said about him in the 4th century. He truly deserved this name. The best known episode of his life is the famous story about the date of Easter. Not all Christians were celebrating Easter on the same date, and the Bishop of Rome wanted to sort things out. He said from now on, Easter is to be celebrated on a particular day that all other practices should stop, and anyone doing otherwise I will excommunicate. This obviously caused a lot of unrest, and Irenaeus intervened, explaining to the Bishop of Rome that this was not the proper course of action. There was a real risk of schism because of this issue in his day, and he allowed the Church of Rome to live in harmony with the churches of Asia, which had a different custom to its own. Irenaeus was especially fond of emphasizing the unity of the people of God and the unity of the body of Christ. Irenaeus would say that the different observances only confirm the unity of the faith. We can really see Irenaeus's enthusiasm in his battles against every attempt to standardize, to seek to get everyone to have the same approach and the same way of thinking. I know, my dear Marcianus, your heart is filled with his zeal to find God. Irenaeus addressed his disciple Marcianus with great affection and answered his questions concerning the faith. What Irenaeus wrote to Marcianus would later be known as the demonstration of apostolic preaching. This book can be considered as the first catechism. It is very easy to read, it is accessible to everyone, and depicts a marvelous fresco of the history of salvation. It is the story of God associating his destiny with that of humanity. Irenaeus' thought has irrigated the whole of Eastern and Western tradition, but for centuries it was more or less forgotten. It was rediscovered in the 20th century. Vatican II used Irenaeus' teachings along with the works of other fathers of the Church, and his theology is based entirely on Scripture. You can feel his love for Scripture, which he knows by heart. I suppose that he did not have all the scriptures at his disposal, but he memorized them, just like most people at the time who learned the scriptures by heart. And he demonstrated the faith of the church always using the scriptures. One of Irenaeus' strengths is that he demonstrated the unity of the scriptures. There are two testaments that form a part of a single revelation and they cannot be separated. Nothing from the Old Testament can be rejected. To my knowledge, Irenaeus was the first to make an interesting distinction by describing why man is in the image of God and then looking at why he is in his likeness. And this and is really the place from which his theology developed. It's beautiful. <laughs> Being a man that is in the image of God, it is given, it's a gift. And then with this and in the likeness, he poses a question that is really essential for us, the question of freedom. Man is in the image of God, and he can progress in the likeness of God. For me, that's what makes Irenaeus very endearing, and this answers many of the issues we are facing today. For all those who are interested in self-improvement, this is where they can find personal Christian development, completely rooted in the Bible and in the tradition of the Church.
Et c'est vrai que dans l'Église orthodoxe, it's true that in the Orthodox Church, it is a subject that is very dear to us. We do not talk much about sanctification. Instead, we prefer to talk about deification. And why is this term meaningful for us? Because we, if you will pardon the vernacular, we stick to God. We go to God and we never leave him. We approach him and we stick to him. Irenaeus has an extremely optimistic, extremely positive vision of man who is on a journey to perfect himself with the grace of God, with complete freedom. And this fundamental freedom is very deep and resonates well with the people of today. It is also echoed by Paul when he says, be careful, we have freedom, but how should it be used? How do we use it? God does everything, but he does nothing without man. At one point, he quotes Matthew when Jesus says, Jerusalem, you that kill the prophets, how often have I longed to gather your children together, and you refused. Irenaeus uses this to say, you see, you did not want to. This means that Christ himself respects the will of man. Man refused, and Jesus took man's choice seriously. Naturally, he laments this, but he does not try to force open a door that does not want to open. But if God made us, and as you say, he watches over his creatures, then why all these calamities? God is generous. God is patient. He knows the weakness of men and allows them to experience good and evil. And this is so that they choose good. Man is free from the beginning. Don't forget, you're not the one who makes God, it is God who makes you. One of the very innovative avenues taken by Irenaeus was this extraordinary idea that God created man simply for his own pleasure. It may seem a bit trite to say it like that, but for centuries after Irenaeus, the prevailing understanding for the reason for the Incarnation was in terms of putting right what had gone wrong. Basically, creation was broken because of original sin and it had to be repaired. This was not particularly flattering, not just for God, because he had failed in the work of creation, but also for man, because it meant nothing less than having to stick the broken pieces back together. For him, there isn't a sort of cosmic catastrophe that we would call original sin. Of course he talks about the sin of Adam and its universal consequences. He doesn't deny that at all. But it's as if it was part of a growing up. And what is very beautiful is that he really has this vision of humanity growing since the very beginning. This is the image he gives in his teachings. Humanity was created as a child, in the state of childhood. And like a child, we make mistakes, we get things wrong. We can commit evil, but growing will gradually allow us to get away from this evil, from being imprisoned in evil. And it is also an issue of freedom for Irenaeus, because he read Paul, who spoke about the slavery of sin. In fact, we are a long way away from all these techniques by which, finally, man would save himself by himself, without God, and would not even need the idea of God to reach a form of fullness of inner peace. Man comes from God as a creature and is called to return to God, being remade in Christ. But to return to God, not as if we are going back to square one after failing with original sin, but if you'll forgive the modern jargon, being an extended person. The glory of God is the life of man, and the life of a man is the vision of God. We have to see that for the ancients, 
The vision came not from the outside, but from within. That is to say, it was not about being transformed by God from the outside, but it was really about being transformed from within by God himself. This vision of Irenaeus is incredible and refreshing. For him, God desired the incarnation of Jesus for all eternity. It is the summit and the perfect fulfillment of his plan of love. In Christ, divinity makes contact with humanity forever. And never, however profoundly lost we become, does the Creator abandon his creature. Man progresses. He walks towards his fulfillment in Christ, which is a bit like the Omega point, which was so dear to Teilhard. It is true that we sometimes compare Irenaeus and Teilhard de Chardin. In the human phenomenon, Teilhard shows this constant progression, the evolution of humanity from its childhood on. Humanity has everything to learn, but God is there and teaches him everything little by little. One of the other great ideas of Irenaeus, which is very interesting and must not be forgotten, is man's growth rate. It's a slow pace. Man grows slowly, like a tree, like any plant. It does not happen like that overnight, and we must respect this rhythm. That's what God does. God is patient. Some people say that only a small number will gain eternal life. And you, Irenaeus, do you think that everyone can be saved? This world around us, the animals, the sky, the stars, the whole cosmos? Isaiah prophesied, the wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down near the kid. All this will happen to the animals and to the cosmos at the time of the resurrection. Every creature, according to the will of God, will grow and reach its fullness. This wound that is death, God will heal it. In the end, Irenaeus doesn't offer us a system of thought or an ideology, but a form of integral theology, which embraces the cosmos as a whole and the whole history of man. In this integral theology, Irenaeus, among the fathers of the church, has developed something that is particular and unique to him, that is called recapitulation. In fact, he took this term from Paul, he borrowed it from Paul, and he used it in a very direct way. If my memory is correct, in Against Heresies, he used it about 50 times, either the word itself or the verb recapitulate. For him, recapitulation is the idea that, as human history progresses, as God develops the whole divine economy, Christ arrives at the right time. And Christ recapitulates all things, starting from Adam up to us, and to the end of history, that is, to the end of time. Pour Irénée, la création for Irenaeus, creation is never finished. God is present in creation every moment, every second. At the very moment we speak, at the very moment when we think of an idea or talk about it, we are created again, and every part of our progress is a new creation. Irenaeus had the brilliance of integrating time into his thought, to integrate what history can learn from man and for man. His conception of man is quite apart from the usual Greek way of thinking. The normal Greek thought is that time is change, and change is something contrary to the divine. The divine does not change. Perfection does not change. On the contrary, for Irenaeus, progress, time, history are opportunities to perfect oneself. So perfection is not a state, it is not something fixed. It is on the contrary something dynamic, which in reality has no end, since its goal is God himself. The first centuries of Christianity were like a vast building site. The dogmas of faith, the canons of the scriptures, in other words, the list of officially recognized biblical texts, all this was not yet fixed. 
And in this vaguely defined landscape, strange sects sometimes flourished. Irenaeus spent a lot of energy fighting one of those sects he calls the so-called Gnosis. This sect held the belief that salvation came through knowledge and was only for certain initiates. Irenaeus wrote a major work called Against Heresies to address the Gnosis. When people talk about Irenaeus' optimism, I find it here. His vision is not dualistic because a person as a whole is in the image of God. He does not distinguish between a beautiful, all-pure, separate soul and a body that weighs it down. That was not at all his vision. The Gnostics were completely dualistic. They had a completely ethereal vision of God, the most inaccessible possible. So that only a small elite could approach him, which naturally eliminates those who are not worthy. So many criteria that are, in fact, uh, anti-evangelical. When I first came to the parish of St. Irenaeus, I left the Manguette, a popular district in Lyon, and I was struck by the esoteric drifts towards, or the temptations to follow, New Age trends, which very much resemble the gnosis that Saint Irenaeus fought at the time. This led me to go deeper into this question, to see how Irenaeus, in his struggle, joins up with current issues. Today, in my opinion, these temptations are still there, seeking out other explanations, not being satisfied with revelation and believing that God always needs to add something to the first revelation that has been given to us in Jesus Christ. We could imagine that Jesus is a kind of superman who had exceptional powers, who knew everything before it happened. There are still Christians today who are tempted by this response and who have great difficulty in accepting the full humanity of Jesus. No one should imagine that there is another Father God than the one who made us. That's what heretics think. They despise the God who is in order to construct a God who is not. Many people have been deceived by error and have moved away from the truth. Even in his struggle against the Gnostics, Irenaeus remained a man of peace. While trying to demonstrate the falsity of their doctrine, Irenaeus was also concerned with bringing people together. He wanted to understand what Gnosis was, to take time to study this religious movement and then to expose it and to show why we should not follow it. This is yet another way of respecting your opponent. He did not start straight away with the word excommunication in his mouth, saying you shouldn't think like that, they are wrong. He exposed their doctrine. Sometimes he made fun of it a little because he had a sense of humor, but he took time to really explain things. And so we could say that he brought back unity by preventing a number of Christians from going off elsewhere. You can feel it, the place of the Holy Spirit, the way in which he speaks of the Holy Spirit. We can see that he does not speak of it as an idea or a concept. He speaks of it as a principle of life within him, someone who makes him alive. So he's a spiritual man and he is a pastor because his concern for the souls entrusted to him is reflected in his works. Cited 19 times during the Second Vatican Council, Irenaeus has become a great ecumenical figure for us today. And what if this theologian from the second century could reconcile us all? Catholics, Protestants, Orthodox, Evangelicals?
Irenaeus in the second century was there before all the councils, therefore before Christian thought became dogmatized, and no council was going to be against Irenaeus. All the councils would confirm the thought and theology of Irenaeus of Lyons. And that's why he's a very great theologian, a very important one. He understood in advance, we could say, what would happen in the councils, even if it was in embryonic form. He is at the beginning, so it's not surprising. But we can still draw from him to confirm all the councils, right up to the last council, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Dear friend, here is the preaching of the truth. It is the path of life. This path, we must keep to it with the greatest care possible. I've known Irenaeus for more than 20 years. I came across him in my studies. But my studies aside, I like to say that I met Irenaeus before I met my husband. He had to take us both at the same time. Actually, Irenaeus has been my companion on my journey because he's not dry nor boring. He's not a book. He's not something to learn by heart. Not at all. He's someone who gives life. And personally, I really consider him a companion because he helps me on my journey. If you are God's handiwork, expect his hand everywhere. Give yourself to him who can mold you, he who does everything well. Only the Lord can make a work of art out of the poor clay which is yourself.